Okay, good evening, everybody, in person and on Zoom. We are starting session two of the PEAK, uh, our Orthodoxy 101 class. So uh, just one item, kind of like housekeeping item. Uh, Tuesday, September 26th, we will not have this meeting because I have to have oral surgery the day before. So I will be pretty much incapacitated for a couple of days. I have a, a impacted wisdom tooth, 36 years old, impacted wisdom tooth on the bottom left side that needs to be removed. So the 25th is the day. So keep me in your prayers that day. Uh, I'm sure everything will be fine, but hopefully the recovery is uh, quick. So I'm doing it on Monday so that hopefully by Sunday I'm functional again. So there won't be any, we won't have class that night on the 26th. Okay. Uh, I'm going to recap really quick what we discussed last week. So last week we talked about how knowing God is the foundation, the basis of our salvation. This is eternal life. And you know the true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So we should never be like complacent to be distanced from God in our life, but always be seeking him out. And because God has worked, God has one of the things that God has done is he has worked hard to reveal himself to us so that we can know him, especially in his son, Jesus Christ. So this is what God wants. God wants us to know him, right? So that we can have life. And so we shouldn't be like accepting to be far from him. We should always be striving to grow closer and closer to the Lord. That being said, knowing God is not a mental exercise. Remember, we talked about this. I shared this story from uh, Saint, the life of St. Augustine. You know, seeing the child trying to dig the hole on the beach big enough to fit the ocean and how this is like what we try to do when we try to comprehend God with our mind. Knowing God is not a mental exercise. So even though reading is important, right? Reading the scriptures, the lives of the saints, the teachings of the fathers of the church, these things are important. But we can't just read the books, right? We can't just read the books and think that we know God. Knowing God uh, is coming to know a person, right? Who is to be loved is not a subject to be studied. So we have to encounter him on a personal level. And we do that through various means. We talked about the worship life of the church. We talked about our personal prayers and devotions, our prayer, our fasting, our almsgiving, uh, holy confession, uh, again, the, the liturgical life and the divine liturgy. These are things that we do that engage and encounter the living God. What we believe matters. We talked about that too. How what we believe matters. What we believe shapes who we are becoming. For us as Orthodox Christians, our involvement in the church, our life in the church is not just a simple like trying to fulfill some obligation or to fulfill some duty or give ourselves like mental peace that we went to church that week. We are becoming something. We are in the process of becoming something new, becoming someone new. Uh, the person that God has made us to be through his son, Jesus Christ. So what we believe shapes that person that we're becoming okay, through the life of the church. We are not all the arbiters of truth when it comes to God, because God is truth himself. Okay, so we can't just sit here and make theories that sound good and, you know, teach that to other people. And hopefully they agree with us or maybe they disagree with us. Right. That's not what we're doing. here. We're not testing philosophies against each other. This is not a philosophy class. There is a truth. That truth is objective. Right. It's not subjective. Uh, and because God, again, is a person, not a philosophy. So uh, that's kind of where we left off last week. And we talked a little bit about the importance of coming to know God and, and struggling and trying to, to struggle to encounter God in our life. Are there any questions, outstanding questions or concerns from last week? If you're on the Zoom call, by the way, you can type questions into the chat or unmute yourself to ask. Uh, any questions from in the room or on the Zoom call? We'll have time at the end to answer more questions too. So if there's something you're kind of wondering about that maybe doesn't pertain to the topic, we can hang on till the end as well. So uh, with that, we'll begin uh, today's session. So I recently read uh, two books. They're two part, they're fiction novels. And uh, the, it's called, uh, the first book is called Ready Player One. And the second one is called Ready Player Two. I don't know if you, there's a movie of the first one. I don't know if, you, if, you, if anyone has seen it, but the basic premise of this uh, movie is that pe earth, earth life on earth has gotten so bad that people are now basically like spending most of their time in this virtual reality uh, called the oasis and so they put on these visors and they have these gloves and they're basically like living like a video game life because in the video game world it's like paradise 
uh, you're, you can be whoever you want and there's beautiful places you can go and you can see all these things and learn all these things that otherwise were not accessible. In the second part of the book, uh, it gets even more extreme where basically the, in the end, um, the main characters realize that through the technology that they've developed, they can actually like copy, they can like scan people's brains and make copies of them in the virtual world, basically granting immortality. This is the world word that they use, right? Granting immortality to these people that, you know, go through this process. Humanity can be immortal in this, in this uh, digital world, which at the conclusion of reading this book, I was horrified. Um, that's not something that I find appealing or attractive at all, but you know, when we read these things, we, we think, oh, well, that'll never happen. And yet these things are developing in that way. Like, for example, for those of you who are maybe aware or not aware, now there's like AI technology. There's uh, what's it called? GPT chat or Google Bard, right? These things are AI technology where you can actually like have conversations with like historical characters, right? You can have, you can like talk to, you know, people who have passed on in Google or whoever, GPT chat, like formulates responses based on what the internet has to offer and whatever, including uh, Jesus Christ himself. So my, I want to ask a question for you guys to discuss as pairs, and then we'll share out. If you're online, you can write, maybe write down your responses. But my, my question is, what does it mean to be alive? Okay. Is AI alive, right? Are the fictional characters in the book that I read who copy themselves and are like a computer version of themselves in the in the oasis are they alive does that constitute life so that's the first question so take a few minutes pair up i don't know if you guys want you guys are always together so maybe you want to maybe you guys want to change it up a little bit but um pair up if you're online take a minute to um take a minute to think about the question and then if you want to share out answers you can as well so what constitutes real life is ai real life Go ahead. Go talk. A couple minutes. <laughs> and I, I want to hear your I want to hear your reasonings too, not just yes or no, but I want to hear the reasonings. It's not really yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it all it all has to be right? It's not something it doesn't think intelligently by itself, right? I mean, I have a hard time grasping what you hear all these things. Yeah, yeah, I think it's chatting. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I just kind of skim over the article. I mean, I really don't. And I think that's kind of like what the book is gearing towards. Yeah, what you're saying. It doesn't think for itself. And you said, no, all these things that we use, they have to be created. They don't just bring into existence. So, you know, without us, it wouldn't even exist. So, but overall, it's probably human. human. I, I don't know if they have to keep that, believing to do that. It's like that yeah, it's harder to keep human in order to create a human. You create a human, not afraid of it, appreciate it, see it. Yeah. You don't just like the world. Take 20 more seconds to finish up your discussion. It's not my own. Life is to be living and created in the soul. And us as Christians, we keep our soul to see. All right, let me sh let me share some responses from Zoom. Okay. Uh, Joyce says, as a teacher, AI is a real big problem. Kids can use it to turn and work. It's very scary because it is becoming harder to distinguish between real and AI. Uh, Denise says, alive to me is blood, heartbeat, touch, love, not networks. Uh, Denise, it will become worse. Joyce's computers are going to look uh, human. So, and then Joyce says AI will start to take over different professions too. I feel. All right. Any. Uh, so, if you're on, if you're in the room, what did you? What were you? What were your? What was the consent? Was there a consensus? Was there a discussion? 
AI is not real. AI is not I mean, real not life. Living. It's not real life. It's not living. There's no soul. Okay. But it's, just, it's, it's a simulation of humanity, but it's not. A, I feel like it's an overall deception. Okay, it's a deception. Uh, Dory says alive is experiences with sentiment in the environment. No soul. Chelsea, I believe AI, AI is scary as well because it is becoming a problem taking people's jobs. Maybe even trying to take identities. Interesting. So what then distinguishes AI from real human life? What distinguishes? What does a human do that AI can't? To reload. decide, like, at whim, anything. Mm -hmm. like, you can't just, like, assume that by by a certain trajectory you would, like, I don't know, I feel like if you, if you give the computer the algorithm and then it knows these steps and it goes in this path, but it never all of a sudden just, like, throws that out the door and goes another direction. Like, for me, I guess I would, if I were equating it to something in the scripture, would be like, you have, is it, it, it's Peter and Judas, where one has remorse and, and yes, one has yes. repentance. They both betray okay. Christ, yeah. But yeah. One repents, so yeah. you could be going down this negative path that, like, for at least in my mind, the computer then knows, like, you've been going on this trajectory, and so it's assuming how then you would behave, and then it's, like, projecting that out there and going, oh, this will be the next step. But, like, humans have free will, so, like, yes, your next step could be down a hellish path, but you can all of a sudden throw that out the window and repent and go the other direction. Okay. Any other thoughts? What makes a human a human and AI not a human? So my, so playing devil's advocate, what if, because AI, AI is developed and has been developed in such a way where the computers will continue to learn, right? The more people use it, the more people go, you know, the more the internet expands, it will actually will continue to learn. And theoretically, at some point, it could develop kind of like becomes autonomous, you know, it could become autonomous. Uh, I don't know, you know, obviously you read different things and some of that, you know, my mind always goes to like the Marvel movie, uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, when like Ultron tries to take over the world and kill everybody, basically. But, um, you know, there's so like, what if it got to that point, though, where, where AI was making its calling the shot, calling its own shots, and it had autonomy? It would still be, I don't know, I, I don't know enough about AI or, or what it's capable of. 20 years from now or five years from now but it seems to me like it's going to always if, if it's going to learn and progress then that means it's always going to try it's always going to do what it calculates to be the best thing whereas human beings are free to screw up mm -hmm. which we do all the time and we screw up and we forgive and we get mad and we love and we do all these things so I don't know can AI replicate emotion can it replicate stuff like that i you know at this point in time maybe but does it reason or does it do i think it's like a movie to that i think it's like a purely rational uh person that may be able to acquire a lot of rational power just a world of power I mean, can it hate or without a soul or without let's hope oh, let's hope not <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, That part of the human experience, it can't, it can't repeat that. Okay. It can acquire a lot of logical and rational information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the. Uh... So there, it can be. So it can acquire a lot of knowledge, kind of like rationally, but you know, it can, it doesn't have a soul. So the divine realm is kind of cut off in that way. Okay, that's interesting. So today we're going to talk about humanity. Okay, so we're going to talk about the church's basically its anthropology. What does the church teach about being a human being, and what are human beings are, and why we're here? And you know, we're not going to answer all the deep questions of life, you know, but we're gonna we're gonna try to tackle things from an orthodox perspective. So, uh. Why did God create man? Why are we here? To answer that question, we have to go back to the very beginning. So I'm going to start actually in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John. So in the scriptures, of course, we have four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John actually begins, St. Saint, Saint John the Evangelist begins his gospel with a prologue where he says, 
and it starts in this way. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So he's talking about, and he uses the terms phrase in the beginning. We'll see that he's actually, I'll now quote it in a second, but he's actually quoting from Genesis, the first line of the Bible, of the scriptures. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, which is some very nice uh, Greek uh, translation, you know, but it's uh, uh, basically saying that everything was made through the word of God. So what is this saying? St. John is saying that from the beginning, from before the beginning of time, from before creation, God was there. And not just God the Father, but also God the Word, who is eventually will become incarnate, will become a human being that we know as Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So this person, Jesus, along with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, is there at the beginning, before anything is made. And through them, through the Holy Trinity, all things come into being. So what does this show us about God? It's that he is before time. He is timeless. Okay? And they've been there since, even from before in the beginning. And that's important because they're eternal. That means they're unchanging. So God does not change like we do with the weather right uh god is always the same the stable kind of force that's driving the universe now let's go now to the beginning of the old testament genesis the first book of the old testament in the beginning god made heaven and earth that's the first genesis 1 1 very first line of the scriptures now what does this very short line teach us about who god is because remember we're trying to get to we're trying to know who god is what does it teach us that he is, that not only was he there in the beginning, but he created everything. Okay? So God is the creator. He is all powerful. He is awesome. And he is completely transcendent. He's not like us, right, at all. We, if, if, if God gave us the task of making one little pebble of sand out of nothing, we were, even after a million years, we could not figure out how to do it, right? And yet God, just with his thoughts and his words, he basically speaks the universe into, into being. He creates from nothing. So he is he is God and we are people, right? We're humanity. And those are two different things. So a lot of times I think we think about God sometimes in humanistic forms, you know, humanistic terms, or we think about God being happy with us or sad with us, or like kind of like we use human terms to 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 define what God is doing or how he how he's feeling that day. But that's really not necessarily true about god because god is always the same his mission has always been the same and his work has always been the same and he is great and far beyond anything that we are so that's important for us to, un to understand god's complete transcendence over us he is he's on a different level than we are he is not part of creation everything in creation will die and fade away god will not fade away all right so in later on in chapter one of genesis 25 verses later we hear about the creation of mankind. So God creates the whole world in six days. We know the basic premise. He creates the heavens and the earth. He creates uh, He creates the, the waters above the heavens and the waters below the heavens. He separates the land and the water. He puts fish in the ocean. He puts birds in the air. He puts animals on the ground, trees, plants for the animals to eat. Right? He creates everything. And once all that's done, in chapter 1 of Genesis, he creates humanity. So let's look at the text really quick. Then God said... Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, uh, 26 to 27. So God, the last thing, in chapter 1 of Genesis, the last thing that God creates is mankind man and woman so it's the god's the culmination or like the crown right imagine uh for those of you who saw like the, the coronation of, uh, of king uh, charles right it's like the black, bam the crown that's like the the symbol of the that the work is done okay so humanity is like the crown of creation it's the diamond uh, of everything that god has done and mankind just like god is different from creation Mankind is different from the rest of the created world. Even though it's part of the created world, it's different. Mankind is made. What's different about mankind is that we're made in God's image and his likeness. Okay. More on that in a minute. So all the things that had been created up to this point, again, the land and the water and the birds and all the plants and things like that, 
Everything up to this point has been earthly. The souls that animate them are not eternal, right? So mankind also is earthly, right? We're made out of, in Genesis 2, it talks about how mankind is made from the dust of the earth, right? God takes the dust of the earth and creates Adam. He makes the man. So we're also earthly. But in Genesis 2, we hear about how God breathes his own breath into the man, right? So when we not only have the earthly elements to us, we also have a spiritual element to us. Like God has breathed his own breath into us. We are a body, but we're also a soul. We're part of the earth, but we're also spiritual. And a good way to think about that or to a good reality that shows us that, and we talked last week sometimes about how the natural world reveals a lot about how the truths about God. God made mankind on two legs. So we're rooted in the earth, right? Our feet are on the ground when we walk, but our heads are at the top of our bodies and we can lift them up easily to the heavens, right? We have no problem looking up and thinking about God, right? And contemplating God and searching for God. Whereas for animals who are on four legs, their heads are facing down, right? For them to lift their heads all the way up like that, they'd have to be probably like in a lot of pain and be like just jerking. They would not probably not do that intentionally or be able to hold their gaze up to the heavens. So one way that we can think about that is like even just the way that we're constructed, we are made in both realms, both the earthly and the spiritual. So what does this mean? It means that we, just what it is, right? That we are body and soul and that both things have to be tended to, right? Yes, we are a body. The Orthodox Church does not teach that the body is evil, right? Or that the body is to be kind of like ignored, okay? The body has to be cared for in, its, in the proper way and maintained. And yet we also have the spiritual side of life which is of an even higher priority. Okay? The spiritual, the body actually is in its proper health when the spirit comes first, right? So we as people living today, searching for God, trying to be the best versions of ourselves we can be, we cannot abandon the spiritual life. We will, not, we will first of all, we're like become less human. The, the more we ignore our spiritual life, the less human we become, the more animal we become. Because humans were made in this way. We're made to be um, spiritual and approaching God. So the spiritual life is hugely important. Hi, come on in. Come on in. Um, we're not just a body, right? As people, we're not just a body that needs food, right? Or clothing or whatever, right? Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That's not it, right? There's more to life than just that. And you can think of like the example of many of the saints who lived without a lot of these basic, you know, basic human needs. And yet they never felt as, as suffering because they were with God. They, they lived their life as you know, with God and searching for God. When we live our life entirely focused on the earthly things, then the visible realm um, or the, uh, then the earthly realm kind of becomes the only thing that we can really perceive or experience which is not great and actually in our times so like the time the era that we live in this is one of, this is like one of the defining characteristics of of mankind is that for us we really struggle to see beyond what we call the imminent framework so the things that are like directly in our presence the things that we can see and touch and hear right so if we basically if we can't sense it ourselves or if it's not in our immediate presence and we have a really hard time grasping or engaging with it or even thinking that it's real, right? So um, we have to make sure that the spiritual part of our lives comes first. And then the physical things will, will fall into place. Uh, you can think about the words of Christ, right? Who says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the food you're going to eat and the clothes you're going to wear, right? So he's saying, if you worry about the kingdom of God, everything else will fall into place. If you worry about the earthly more than the spiritual life, or you ignore the spiritual life in favor of the earthly, then you're basically like AI. You're cutting yourself off from the experience of the divine, because that's that's the soul is how we how we connect with God in that way. I think in the modern day times, I think the phenomenon that de defines this for us in in America, right, is uh is the sports phenomenon that's taken place in our times, right. Sports has exploded in this country 
and all the many of our kids are playing sports. And now when do sports happen a lot? Sunday mornings, right? And a lot of times that becomes the priority for us, right? For us as people, we have a really hard time saying no, right? We can't be there on Sunday mornings. And so we, a lot of times we fall into the trap of the earthly taking precedence over the spiritual. And that's a really dangerous thing for us. So um, just wanted to, to touch that point because I think it's important for us to always remember that we are both a body, but also a soul. The basic, this is like the basic definition of a human being, right? So if we ignore the soul, then, then we're in trouble. Uh, really, we have to work hard to maintain our spiritual health at all costs, above all else. And that's what the saints show us, right? That they spared nothing in order to maintain their life in Christ. Another interesting thing from this Genesis is that, what we heard in Genesis, is that God gives men total authority over his new creation, right? God makes everything. And it's beautiful, right? It's not like he like did it halfway, right? Like God makes everything perfect, right? Trees with fruit. Everything they could have won. Uh, the animals were obedient to them, right? It's not like today where if you walk into a bear's near a bear, you know, cave where the bears are and the, the cubs are there, the mama bear is going to come out and maul you, right? That was not the reality of the first humans. The animals were obedient to them, right? The lions didn't come and attack them in the savannah, right? The, the, this was not the reality. The animals were obedient to them. The plants bore their fruit effortlessly so that they could enjoy and have life. Everything was perfect made for them and he made them last and placed them like as kings and king and queen over his new palace for them no weeds to be pulled nope everything you know it's interesting because god make places them in the garden and he tells adam that you will work you know you'll work the, the fields but the work bears fruit right like how many times i can't tell you how many times i've planted stuff in my garden and i'm pulling weeds and i'm putting stuff you know i'm fertilizing and doing this and then it's like you get like two tomatoes right you know out of the plant and it's so frustrating that was not re adam's reality adam's like putting a spade in the ground and like the plants coming out and tomatoes are on the vine right they're like they're ready to go everything came as it was supposed to be right so on top of that if it wasn't perfect enough we hear in genesis 2 how adam walked with god right like god would walk with adam in the garden right they would they would spend time together God shared his life with them and they shared their life with him. That's, that is our, an image of what communion is, right? That we, and we walk with God and God is walking with us. And so this is how humanity started, right? This was the starting point for humanity. And we see here again, how much God loves us. He made this perfect paradise, the garden of Eden and brought us there so that we could be rulers over it with God, right? Not to abuse it as we have, unfortunately, but but to take care of it and cultivate it and be stewards of it on God's behalf so that it can reach its fulfillment and purpose. He gave us life. Why? Because of his love. Love is the answer to that question. Why are we here? If anyone ever asks, why are we here, right? Because God loves you. You're here because God loves you. The first people, you know, in the Genesis were created because God loves them. God doesn't need Adam and Eve, okay? That's another thing when, you know, it's like, oh, God needs you to do this. God, no, God doesn't need you for anything. Okay. God, like I said, God is God. He's up there. He literally created the whole universe by speaking. Okay. He doesn't need anything that we have to offer. It's like a little child bringing a dandelion to its parent. You know, like, what does that mean for the parent? Nothing. Right. <laughs> it's like our gifts to God. He doesn't need it, but he offers to share his life and his love with us because of his love. Okay? Everything happens because of his love. And his, the love of God is the great force that drives the universe and upholds everything, even our very life, our very breath and heartbeat. Any uh, questions so far before I continue? Questions, comments, concerns? So we are body and soul, and we're very loved, okay? Very loved by God. Those are the two takeaways so far. Now let's talk a little bit about Kind of the again the defining characteristic of mankind that we are made in God's image and likeness. What does that mean? Take a minute now. Again, let's talk. Partner up. You guys, can, you three can talk in the corner there. What do you think it means that we are made in God's image and likeness? Those two terms. What do you think it means? Take a minute. Talk together, and then we'll share out some responses. Same thing on Zoom, people. 
you can do it just like you did. Type in your responses in the group chat and I'll share them out. <laughs> Yes. Right. Right. Well, I have it. It's the big thing. Change our mind. All right, let's take 30 more seconds. All right, let's wrap up our thoughts. All right, uh, from the room here, anyone want to share their ideas? You don't have to, but. <laughs> Rose? Well, we can do. We can do a lot of the things that God does to a lesser extent. Okay. So, so we can do a lot of the things that God does, not quite to, with the power and majesty that he does. Right. But we can but do a lot of those. So we're capable of creating. Okay. We're capable of loving. Mm -hmm. you know, um, so creativity, love. Intelligence. Yep. Rationality, sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we're made to reflect the tr the character traits that God exhibits. Okay. Yeah, not necessarily the physical. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're spiritual the way that God is. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, on Zoom, we had some responses. I think it means we are made in the image morally and spiritual nature. I think that was kind of like what Andrew said there. Uh, I think it means we have his spirit in us. That was Chelsea. We were made to try to be like him, just as children resemble their parents. We need to be as good as possible to be like God. Uh, Joyce, thank you. Denise, I think we can love and forgive and do for others as he did. Dory, we are part of his earth and we share his spirit, um, which encompasses his love that we should have for each other. A lot of good responses there. A lot of good responses. So when we, so image and likeness are two different terms. Okay. So image, image literally means uh, that he has made us with his like imprint. Okay. We are literally uh, like when we think of um, the word uh, or when we think of like the ancient pagan religions, think of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, right? They built, they were, they made statues that represented their gods, right? And they believe that in these statues, the gods would become present, right? The gods would possess these material things and become present. So those for them were the images of the gods. Okay? For us, or like, in, again, in the ancient world, like ancient Egypt, the Pharaoh was like an image of God, right? Like he was like divine. That Roman emperor was divine in that sense that he was like God's representative on earth. Well, here in the Genesis story, when it says that we are made in his image, God, it's basically saying that God has made us his representatives, right? He makes the first man and woman in the garden. And what are they, what is their job? It's to rule over creation. Well, that's God's authority, right? So he's made them to be his representatives, to stand in his place. That we have that, right? That that's how God has made us glorious, right? Authoritative um, with power and, and majesty, just like he has. 
uh, he's he's made us with his imprint on it. And I think that's kind of like what Kendra was saying, right? That we have within us, we have goodness and kindness and, and peace and joy, right? That all these things are available to us, um, that we have reason and, and freedom and creativity, like, like this group up here was saying, that these things are part of our human nature, right? That we can think for ourselves, that we can make decisions for ourselves, that we're creative. And we're made to use that to represent God and his work in the world. We're called to be manifestations of God in the world. Not that we ourselves are divine, but we're called to be like little little God, you know, little little Christ. And we talk about that in the church after we take communion. Right? That's one of the things that we talk about, how when we receive the body and blood, we become like little Christs. And we go into the world and we're supposed to represent him and be his hands and feet and voice. So this should be nothing that's like, uh, you know, for those of us who are in the church, this should be nothing, not a new idea, right, that we're God's representatives. What's interesting is that in the ancient times, right, that was reserved who for the king, the emperor, the pharaoh, right? It was like the one person who had the power, had like the political or um, earthly power, had the same divine power. But in the scriptures, what do we see? That it's not reserved for any one particular person, that that is literally in every human being that walks the earth has that image of God on them. It's very powerful for us that we have each human life has that you know, regardless of ability or whatever, right? Every human being has that within them. Very powerful. God has made us um, so beautifully and wonderfully. Now, when we talk about likeness, being like God, really what that means is that we have the potential to become like God, right? That we have the potential to become like God. Uh, I, I read um, once in a, in a book by uh, Father Anthony Canaris of Blessed Memory. He says that, God is the infinite. He's the infinity, right? He reaches to forever and ever and ever. And man is infinite potential. So we can grow and learn and become more and more and more and more to infinity, right? Forever and ever. And that's really even when we talk about sidebar here, when we talk about heaven and salvation, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about that forever for the rest of eternity, you know, not even for the rest, because it'll just be eternity at that point, right? that we will grow continually more and more like God and we will never catch him because he can't be caught right? because he's God. So that's a, it's a hard for us to wrap our minds around, but that's the destiny of mankind. That's why we were made. We were made so that we could become more and more and more like him. So how can we become like God when we just said, right, that he is transcendent. He is way beyond us. He's above us and his power is, is reaches far beyond anything that we could even begin to imagine so how can we become like him we become like him by sharing our life with him right by establishing communion with him first of all through his own grace and love right first that comes from him first of all right just like he makes adam a play and any even places them in the garden and he walks with them in the garden right it's not like they do anything to like summon him and then he appears he's not the genie from aladdin right that's not what's going on here um so the first move kind of comes from God, but then also by us committing our life to be with him as well, right? The more, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's like the more you spend time with somebody, you start to take on more of their personality. And I don't know if you find that to be true in your own life, but um, I certainly have caught myself where it's like I'm sitting with somebody for a long time. And then I realize that I've like assumed the same like posture as them. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. And it's really, and then I like catch myself and it's really awkward. So then I like awkwardly try to like move my hands, you know, and change positions a little bit. But the idea is that when you share your life with God, when you open your life with to God and you allow him to be part of your life, not like kind of like keeping him at an arm's length, but like when you're like trying to, you know, embracing him and like like a child holding clinging to its parents legs, you know, because it wants to be picked up. When we approach God like that, then we start to take on. We start to take on him. Right. We start to take on his own his own grace. And this is why God made us. Right. We made, he made us out of his love so that he could share his life with us and that we could share our life with him and make that one life, okay? Like unify that those two things together so that we could become something greater than we could ever become by ourselves. God's vision for humanity is that of absolute glory, right? When Christ ascends into heaven, the, the scripture says that he, you know, that he ascended in glory and sits in glory at the right hand of the Father. That's the destiny of every human being that believes in God and struggles to maintain the spiritual life. 
for him. Now, he wants us to be glorious like he is. Now, we all know that that all sounded really great. But in Genesis, the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall. And I think this for me as a priest, this is one of the most misunderstood passages, right? Because the question is like, why did God have to put the tree there? You know what I mean? Like if God didn't have the tree there, they would have never eaten it and everything would have just been great and fine, right? Nothing would have, nothing bad would have happened. They couldn't have sinned, right? And it, for a lot of people, it's like, it seems like God is setting them up to fail, right? That like God puts something there that they know they cannot resist. I'm going to take it from a different angle. He's, he, he puts them in this paradise. He wants them to love him, right? And for them to accept his love. But if there's no other option, can he can they actually love him, right? If there's only one choice, and that's God, then are they people or are they robots? Are they puppets, right? If there's no other choice. So when God puts the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which, by the way, is next to the tree of life, which sounds way better than the knowledge of good and evil. And there's no punishment if you eat from that tree, right? There's no consequences. If you eat, the only consequence is you live forever. So I don't know what they were thinking. But um, yeah. when he puts the tree there and tells them, if you eat of this tree, you will die. He's not testing them. He's not setting them up to fail. He's giving them a choice to follow him and live with him or to reject him and live their own path right he's giving them a choice because without that freedom that basic image of god freedom right that we're created with with that in that image they can't truly love god or be loved by god because they're just puppets right at that point they're just god's just they're just like god's pets basically at that point and so god gives them a choice to either follow one rule <laughs> in paradise is one rule follow follow or Choose your own path, right? Choose your own adventure. And God basically tells them it's not going to be good, right? It's not going to be fun. So we know what happens next, of course. They eat the fruit. You know, Eve eats the fruit. Adam eats the fruit. They bl Adam blames everybody else except himself. And God then says, right? God then says like that, what the elephant in the room is like, well, now that they've eaten of the fruit and have be basically have learned evil, right? Think of it this way too, right? Knowledge of good and evil. They were walking with God every day. What did they already have? The knowledge of the good. They already had that. So what did they acquire when they ate the fruit? The knowledge of evil, right? So now that they've learned evil, right? By eating them the fruit. If they eat the fruit and if they eat the tree of life, then they'll live forever and they'll spiral out of control forever too. They'll become more and more evil as they go along. We have to cast them out. So Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and in very dramatic fashion, God places an angel with a fiery sword at the gate, right? So there's no chance of going back in. We call this the fall, the fall of humankind. That humanity had this glorious future, this glorious potential. And then it ended up on the outside looking in, you know, weeping over the lost, paradise lost, as we say. Now, another very common misconception, and I think it's because, you know, the America, especially orthodoxy, kind of grew up in America at the same time when the Catholic and Protestant traditions were already very established. We have, a lot of times have a very Western mindset when it comes to what we call the original sin. Okay, Original sin in the West, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dave, but means that Adam and Eve sinned in the beginning and every human being that comes after them has the guilt of the sin on them. Correct, right? It has the guilt of the sin on them. So that means that every human being born is guilty of the sin of Adam and Eve, the original sin. And that's why you need to be baptized so that you can have this original sin cleansed from you, right? And so that you can have a, the chance to live with God's grace and mercy and love and life. Okay? This is not what the Orthodox Church teaches. Okay? The Orthodox Church rather teaches that what the fall did and what the original, the consequence of the original sin was what we call the fallen human condition. Okay? That when Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of paradise, humanity became exposed to pain and suffering and sickness and death. And the very proof of that is that in Genesis chapter four, 
Adam and Eve now have two sons, and what happens? One kills the other one. Okay, Cain kills Abel. So death literally, literally one chapter after they're cast out of paradise, we have the first murder in human history, according to the scriptures. Okay, So this is like a very dramatic way of showing that, right? That now the paradise that they had, that reality is no longer in place. This is what we inherit. So when we're born into the world, we don't inherit the, the, the guilt of the sin. What we inherit is the consequence of the sin. That each of us that have been born, generation after generation after generation, we live in the result of, their, of that sin. That we live in a world that is broken and fallen and subject to pain and suffering and sickness and death. Right? This is what, for us, the original sin is. And for us, baptism... Yes, cleanses the soul of any of our own sins that we've committed, right? But baptism, what it does is that it brings us into the reality of the kingdom of God again, right? We are, we die in the font, we come out a new person, and that person is now part of the church, which is the kingdom of God on earth. So what happens in baptism is that we regain the gate of paradise that was blocked by the angel, right, is now open. For us to walk through but again that's our choice as well so i want to make that point clear as well that for us there's an, the original sin is not the Catholic, the western understanding of original sin but that we have inherited the result and so what that means is that every time i sin as a human being i perpetuate this cycle right i perpetuate the cycle of sin and death and, and all these horrible things that are going on even from the tiniest sin to the biggest sin Every sin that humanity commits, when we, when we look around and see all the horrible things that are happening around us, and there are good things happening too, right? Like, well, it's not, I don't want to cast doom and gloom, right? There's a lot of great things that happen on earth in humanity, a lot of great things that are happening in humanity. But we, every time we sin, we perpetuate that a, a little bit more, right? That we continue the cycle of, of sin and death. So this is the, this is the condition of humanity today, right? So whether we're talking about, you know, AI simulating humans, right, that have, that have died and how weird it is and how, you know, we, or whether it's watching the news and seeing crazy things that are going on or whatever it may be, right? This is the, this is the fallen human condition. That is the result of sin. Last week, we talked about how sin for us as Orthodox Christians is not a matter of crime and punishment, right? It's not a matter of you broke the rule. Now you must pay, right? Do not pay, you know go to go to jail do not pass go do not collect 200 dollars. right that is that's not what we're doing sin is sickness and so when adam and eve sinned they made humanity sick right and that sickness continues because we continue to sin as well now on that cheery note uh as we continue now we'll see how god what god does in response okay so uh, we'll see how God does not just like abandon humanity in this um, great in this great state, but how He responds and how He acts on behalf of humanity to save it from this fallen condition, and how He gives us all a chance to recover that um, brilliant and glorious humanity that, that we lost through our through our sins. Okay, we're at uh, five to eight. Uh, are there any questions? Questions, comments, or concerns? If you're on Zoom, feel free to either unmute yourself or type in a question. It can be about anything, too. It doesn't just have to be about what we talked about tonight. It can be about anything. Questions you've been thinking about or wondering about. Basic questions, complicated questions. I'll do my best to answer, but now's a good time. I've heard this term before in, like, the uh, history of the uh, Jesus. <clears throat> and that, like, it's not that that tree was off limits forever. I, do you know who the source is? He was on a turbo because I was going to say that. Yeah, but just... he spoke about it in a way of like, um, in a way of understanding it kind of like, if you had a child, you wouldn't give the child super sharp scissors because mm. they weren't ready for 
super sure, 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 sure. Mm-hmm. like at a point they would have gained that understanding and the knowledge and the safety and the awareness. would have matured yeah yeah but they just like weren't at that stage so yet. the idea so is that humanity lacked that humanity point. lacked the the maturity to deal with the knowledge of good and evil you know i don't know i'm i i'm um i'm woefully underread when it comes to the fathers you know there's so there's such a vast you know library of what the fathers have written on the topic so yeah i mean it's i'd have to look more into that specifically um again for me too it's not only that they eat the tree of the fruit and you know it's not just even the fruit itself it's what are what are they doing right what does the snake say to eve he says oh did god tell you you would die if you ate that tree he says you're not going to die you're going to be like him that's why he doesn't want you to eat it that's what that's what the snake tells you right he says oh if you if you eat that tree you'll become like god that's why god doesn't want you to have it right that's why he told you you'll die. And so he was like, huh, sounds reasonable, right? So she, that's why she eats it. So she actually eats the, the tree. One of the, you know, she eats the tree be, to become like a God without God, right? But unfortunately for her, she was sold a bad, bad bill of goods, you know? Um, she was promised by the snake that she would become Godlike, which is what we're talking about, right? That, that's what God wants. God wants us to be like God, but we can't do it without him, right? That's pride. That's pride. And that's why we call pride the mother of all this, of all the passions and the mother of all the virtues, because that's where everything stems from pride. So really what the sin of Adam and Eve is, is a sin of pride, thinking they could become like God without God. Which, if you think about humanity today, or humanity throughout history, for that fact, right? Isn't that one of our biggest problems, is that we're always playing God without him, right? Without, you know, whether it's taking a life or whether it's, uh, you know, passing judgment on others or whatever it may be you know or ai right trying to like we were saying right trying to play god without him and that doesn't work that way it's not it's not a that's not a path that leads to life so that's why the fathers and the saints of the church always talk about how everything starts with humility right if you're not humble it doesn't matter what you're doing right <laughs> if you're not humble even if you do these great works it'll be for your destruction Everything will become sour because of your pride. All right, I have a question here or a comment. Let's see. Since we are broken and have been born into a broken uh, humanity, how can we ever have the confidence that we will be forgiven at the awesome judgment seat of God? I know that we have confession so that we can be forgiven. However, we sin each and every day. My biggest fear is that I won't be with God or Christ when my time comes. That fear of God is quite a fear for me. Being a good Christian is not easy. I feel like I can never measure up. Um, yes, uh, that's uh, that pretty much sums up being a human being. So don't feel like it's you're alone in that sentiment. Because yes, if we're trying to measure ourselves up against Christ, which we should do, because if we think about Christ, right? We said, we said, the purpose of humanity is to be godlike, right? Then who is the first and true human being? jesus right because jesus is god and man together right in one one person so we should be measuring ourselves against christ but we will never reach that measure you know we will never will be able to but we also should never question the mercy and forgiveness of god um in the old testament the psalms put it this way it says as far as the east is from the west so god has removed our transgressions from us um and when we look at the New Testament again and again and again and again and again, right? What is Christ always doing? He's always forgiving sinners. Always. He's always forgiving sinners, right? When he's eating with the tax collectors and the Pharisees and the, or the tax collectors and the harlots and the Pharisees are like, what are you doing? You're eating with these sinners. He's like, the sick need the, need the doctor, not the well, right? I came to, I came to, came to save the lost. Or when the, the woman caught in adultery, you know, is basically brought for her execution to be stoned by the Pharisees. And Christ says, neither do I condemn you, go in peace and sin no more, right? Again and again, Peter, right? St. Peter, who, who betrays him and denies him three times, right? He forgives him and reconciles to him. So Christ dies on the cross, which we'll talk about this more next week, right? Christ's death on the cross is the living and forever eternal testament, right? Of, that God loves us more than anything. God does not want to condemn us. God does not want to, to send us away from him. God wants us to be with him. But if we live a life apart from him or a selfish life or a prideful life where everything is about ourselves and not about God, then even when we go to the paradise and sit at the judgment seat, we ourselves will say, 
depart from us, Lord, because we've always lived for ourselves and not for him. That's the danger. That's one of the big dangers of human life is that we think that we're living for God, but really we're just doing everything for ourselves. And then even when we go to the judgment seat, it won't be God sending us away. It'll be us sending God away. And that's not great. So again, when it comes to the spiritual life, start with humility uh, and we'll go from there. Uh, you have a question? I, Comment? Say, I mean, I, I've always thought that he would have forgiven Judas. It's not Judas met his fate. Not That's the, Christ, yeah, right. That's the Judas, difference so. between Judas and Peter, right? right? Peter, Peter sticks around and he goes to the empty tomb and Judas isn't there because Judas couldn't forgive himself, first of all. So he hung himself and so he was not there to, to ask for that forgiveness. Yeah, there's no sin that God will not forgive. If we if we come to him with a broken heart and a contrite heart humbly before him, there's nothing. God. I was telling Mary earlier today, we have saints in the Orthodox Church who are harlots. We have saints in the church who are murderers. We have saints in the church. Any sin that you can think of, we have saints that have committed them. Why are they saints? Because they repented, right? They turned away and they went towards God. And with humility, they approached God and asked for forgiveness. And it's done. It's forgiven. The flip side of that, that kind of worry is, is like, well, what, and they ask yourself, what is the, so for you to achieve peace, you means you, it's like you feel like you have to get to a point where you say, okay, now I'm good enough. I could sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I've made it. I, I've gotten good enough. You know what I mean? So that's like the biggest sin you could possibly, yeah. that's the sin you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would think. Yeah. No, we, we can never we can well. never have that mentality where we've reached the finish line, right? The saints never had that. You know, the saints, even the holiest saint, never had in their mind that they were like worthy of the kingdom of God. I mean, there's stories of saints who on their deathbed were like praying for God to give them 20 more minutes to keep for you know confessing their sins. You know what I mean? So like these are saints that we're talking about. So no, we we can never make it to the if we ever get to a point where we have that thought, we have to realize that that's a temptation from the evil one. And throw it out. I mean, because that is just. There's not, that can be nothing further from the truth, right? We've never, we never get to that finish line. The reality of being a human being, believing in God and striving for God is that there's a tension there between knowing that we are sinful and unworthy of the kingdom and also knowing that God is merciful and wants to put us in the kingdom, right? And living our life in between that tension, right? Within that tension and helping, letting that tension, right? Like, a, a, what do they call those? The, the tight ropes, right? Letting that tension of the tightrope be the path that we walk along to make it to the kingdom of God, you know, to continue our journey towards Christ. All right, Nick, uh, Nick has a question. Can you explain the old calendar and new calendar Orthodox churches? This is a, this is a sidebar question. So uh, at some point in history, and I, I'm not a scholar on this topic, so forgive me. I'm going to just, with my rudimentary knowledge, I'm going to answer as best as I can. At some point in the Western church, the, the scholars and the astronomers realized that the calendar was off, okay? That the calendar that they had been keeping was off by, I think it was like 11 days at that time, okay? So in the West, they adopted what we call the new calendar, okay? So they went forward 11 days, and that, that became the new date of the, of the church year, of not only the, the political year, but also the church year. So in the, in the Orthodox Church, eventually it became a thing where we had to decide if we were going to keep the, quote, old calendar or the new calendar proposed by the West. And in Orthodoxy, some jurisdictions accepted the new calendar and some did not. Okay, so we have within canonical Orthodoxy, for example, you have the Greek Orthodox Church of Greece, the Church of Greece, I should say, in the Patriarchate, for example, who are on the new calendar. You have the Serbians and the Russians who are on the old calendar, okay? but they, they're fine. They're all still part of the same family. You have, however, within Greece, particularly, and I don't know within other countries, when Greece, the Church of Greece switched to the new calendar, you had a group that refused to accept it. Okay? And they broke off from the church and established their own church, which we know them as the old calendarists. Okay? So there's two different things. There are Orthodox jurisdictions that are on the old calendar and then you have the old calendar church and uh they the old calendar i mean we consider that that, that a schism right that schism is um based on that fact that they refused to accept the new calendar and they basically founded 
a new church for them. And I don't, I'm not going to comment at all about their church because I don't know very much about it beyond the fact that they're on the old calendar. I mean, the, you know, you probably, if you walked into an old calendar church, would not be able to tell the difference at all. I mean, it's probably looks exactly the same as a new calendar Orthodox church, but um, they, they hold very staunchly to the old calendar. Uh, and I'll leave it at that because I'm not an expert. Um yeah, no problem, Nick. All right, Dory, uh, I do believe youth sports is a big reason for loss of religion, cast you out if you do not follow their schedule. And it makes it seem like a helpless situation for kids if they want both in their life, unfortunately. Since there are a lot of people that do not follow the commandments, there's a lot of loss on earth due to that. It is a reality. Earth may not be livable to humans. If AI is our next way to live on this earth or Mars, I wonder if God will allow souls to move through AI. Sorry, so long. Um... Yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, first of all, I think it's really hard for families when they're put in a position where they have to make those decisions, right? Whether to have their kids play sports, which their kids really want to do, right? Or whether to have their, you know, kind of like force them to go to church, right? And hopefully as parents and families, we're not forcing, right? Because again, even God, even God doesn't force Adam and Eve, right? To follow the rule, right? Even God in the garden, when Eve goes to reach through the tree, God doesn't whack her hand and be like, no, I told you not to, right? That's not how God operates. So hopefully we're not forcing because forcing a lot of times puts a bad taste in people's mouth. But I will say that the example that we should be following is that of the saints, right? So in the, in the lives of the saints, we have people who were successful businessmen, high ranking Roman soldiers and officials, right? Like my patron saint, St. Demetrius was like a high ranking Roman, Roman um, general, basically. He was a Duke. Um, you had royal you know people members of royal families who lost it all because they chose to follow christ right and while I, I know it's difficult for families to make that decision right that is the example that the saints set for us and i think a lot of times it's hard for us as, as families to make that to make that call because it's hard for the kids right because the kids have a hard time kind of losing out on that experience but again i'll just put that forward that the, the saints show us that Sometimes as Christians, that's necessary, right? Sometimes as, as Christians, we don't get to like be halfway in and halfway out, right? God in, the, God in Revelations in the final book of the New Testament says, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out. This is Christ, okay? To quote Jesus Christ, okay? So we don't get to be like half, halfway, on, you know, it would be a lot easier if we could be, but it's not, right? That's, that's not what God wants, right? We can't love somebody halfway. That's not love, okay? So I'll leave it at that. Um, if there are families that are struggling with this, I'm happy to meet privately and discuss it because every situation is different too. Now, if you're talking about God allowing us to move through AI, I I think that's I think that would make an interesting um, discussion. But I don't think that's something that God personally is interested in because He didn't create us that way, right? Even in the resurrection, this is what I'll point to, right? Even in the resurrection, Christ resurrects with a body. Okay, so. And that's not just for him. That's for all of us. So we believe, right, that when we die and we await the resurrection of the dead, when that day comes, we will be resurrected bodily and body and soul. The whole the whole person will be resurrected again and brought to life again. And we see that if, if you're if you're in church on Holy Friday night, I know it's a long service and where everyone's excited because of the procession outside and the lamentations are so beautiful. After we come back in from the procession. There is a prophecy reading from the prophecy of Ezekiel where God raises up an army from dead bones. Okay, it's fantastic. It's like one of my favorite parts of Holy Week, prophecy of Ezekiel. And literally, Ezekiel is like walking in a valley of dead bones, like dry. He says and they were very dry, right? And then God brings them back to life. And it says it was a vast army, right? This is our vision of the resurrection. So, um, from what we know scripturally and from what we know from Christ's own life and the lives of the saints, right? I don't think God has that intention for us. Uh, I think when it comes to humanity living and moving forever, I think that's why he has the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think that's going to fit on anybody's hard drive. So um, we'll have to just wait. And, uh, you know, when we die on this earth, we'll just wait. And um, God will make all things right in the end because God's not going to be outdone by our own pollution. So I'm sure he can handle it in the end. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I, we're a little over time. So if anybody needs to leave, feel free. There's some more questions coming in, but what does our church believe about what happens to us when we pass or before the second coming is our soul in limbo? No, uh, limbo is another Western idea or purgatory, right? As another, I know those are two different things, but um, no, it's different. Uh, we, we talk about how, when we die, the, the person basically rests, you know, goes to rest and waits for the kingdom, right? Of God, the difference between that and like limbo and purgatory. And again, Dave, you can, if you know, if you're more familiar with these is that there's like a, basically those are like a, a system of like purging, right? Am I correct on that? Right. Like purgatory is like, basically you have to go and be like purged of your sins. And then when that process is over, then you're, you can be saved after that. Yeah. And then if I'm not mistaken, limbo was like the teaching that like introduced like indulgences, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So basically they, it, that um, was like, well, your loved ones in limbo, if you want them out of limbo, then make a donation essentially right to the church and then they'll be they'll be out of limbo so we don't hold that basically the soul there's different to, like we don't know exactly right what happens when we die because 99.99999 percent of the time when somebody dies they don't come back to tell us what happens right usually that's it um but basically what what the church some basic teachings of the church is when the soul dies when a person dies the soul the body and the soul are separated first of all that's what death is the separation right separation of body and soul that's death right we cease to be alive talk about body and soul tonight and then the soul goes and travels to the throne of god and receives like a foretaste of its judgment okay so those who lived righteously will receive like a taste of their of their salvation and those who live unrighteously will have a taste of their condemnation and then the soul goes and, and basically rests and waits for the second coming now what that's like who knows? I mean, we don't we don't know what that's like because again, we don't you know again that's another thing that I'm not particularly well read on. Um, you know, all the different teachings of the different saints of the church. But for us again, the most important thing is preparing ourselves in this life, right, for that moment, right? Preparing ourselves by repenting of our sins, by being humble, by trying to follow God's commandments to the best of our abilities, by treating others with love and care, and committing our life to Christ. But then when we go to the judgment seat. Then when Christ returns, we're not going to be like worried about it, right? Like if we think about it as Christians, like we should be like, like St. Paul writes in his writings, right? He's like, I like, can't wait to die. St. Paul is like, oh man, I wish I could, you know, I wish I could die and go to the Lord, right? Because that's what I want. I want to be with Christ. I want to be with Christ forever, right? And many of the saints, right? I, I was uh, in August, I was reading the and the life of St. Joseph the Hezekast, who's a, a kind of 20th century saint from Mount Athos. And he knew the date he was going to die. It was revealed to him that he was going to die on August 15th. And like the time had like passed that he was expecting to die. And he like started weeping. He like, like couldn't, he like couldn't contain it. He was like still alive. He was like so torn up about it. And then he like died shortly after. Um, but that like, if we live our life for God in a serious way, then we'll like joyously anticipate leaving this life and going into the next. So Hopefully, God willing, we can all, I know it's like kind of crazy to think about, but hopefully we can all get to that point where, you know, we're very comfortable with, you know, leaving this life behind because the next life is the kingdom of God, right? Everything we talked about that was lost by the sin, right, will be restored. So, again, for Christians of, of true faith and life, then there's nothing to be afraid of, right? That's the point of the resurrection is that there's nothing to be afraid of in death, right? Christ is, is the champion of death and has destroyed its power over us. So there's literally nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing that anyone can do to you. The martyrs literally bent their necks, right? So cut my head off. Go ahead, right? Take me. Because they weren't afraid of anything. They had no fear. This, even if you kill me, basically, you can't kill me, right? So that's the power of the gospel, right? That no matter what, we can't be defeated because God's on our side. So anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. A bunch of like lines and what ifs, so. though. Okay. So it's like that for the garden. Like, why did he put the serpent there? Mm -hmm. And then did he know what's going to happen? And then if they would have asked for forgiveness, like, would he have done something else? I just don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're humans, right? So yeah. we like to think about these things. The serpent is part of creation. You know, he's part, the, the serpent is part, but it, but it also he's there. The serpent is there as a representation of the evil one right so not written in genesis but referred to in other places in the scriptures 
before the creation of the physical world, you have the creation of the invisible world. Okay, so that's the realm of the angels, uh, you know, the heavenly realm, the spiritual realm. And what happens, and Christ actually says this himself, right, is that you have an angelic being, the chief of the angels, Lucifer, who revolts, right? He revolts against God, falls from heaven, is cast out of heaven by the archangel Michael, and falls basically from heaven. Isn't that also referring to us, the original sin, is the, is the fall of the angels um, due to pride? Usually when we're talking about original sin, that's not what we're referring to, although I could see that. But do you see how, though, the two stories are parallel to each other, though, right? You have a creation who's created with a with a destiny of glory, who tries to become God without God. And what happens in that rev moment of revolution? They're cast out by the same person, Archangel Michael. That's who's standing at the gate, by the way, right? The Archangel Michael. If you ever see icons of him, what is he holding? He's holding a fiery sword, right? Mm -hmm. That's the Archangel Michael. It's literally the same one who told, who cast out Satan and said, stand well, right? Let us stand well. When we say in the liturgy, Stomen Kalos, right? Let us stand aright. We're repeating the words that the Archangel Michael said when the angel, when the angels were falling, when he rallied basically the angels in heaven. So the snake is there because he's also representing the evil one, right? So the evil one is active, right, in the world, trying to basically get him, get us to do what he did, right? Because he knows that it will be our downfall, because he's jealous of us. <laughs> because he's jealous that God has now taken his lot, which was glory, next on the right hand of God, right? He's God's right hand man. He's taken that place and he's done what? He's given it to humanity in Christ and in everybody who follows Christ. So that's why the snake is there. If Adam and Eve had asked for God's forgiveness, what is this? What did the scriptures tell us? He would have forgiven them, right? But what does Adam do? Does he ask for forgiveness? He's, this is what, literally his words to God who made him, right? And gave him everything. The woman you gave me made me eat of it. <laughs> gave me the fruit and I ate of it, right? So what does he do? Instead of asking for forgiveness, he blames God that he ate the fruit. He blames God. He puts a wall up, right? He puts the wall, he puts a wall up between. He doesn't he doesn't ask for he doesn't humble himself. He literally builds a wall between himself and God and between himself and his wife. He isolates himself. And that's where the problems start. So, we'll never know, right? I mean, the the truth is that's not how the story played out, but the, what God has shown us of himself is that, yes, he would have absolutely would have forgiven them if they would have been humble about it. But again, what we'll talk about next week, right? In the resurrection icon, who's Christ pulling out of the tombs? Adam and Eve, right? So like God never forgot them, right? Or it was never a men means of punishment or like eternal damnation. He always was going to go after them. He always was going to go after them. And he does in his own death and resurrection. And that's, that's, who the, that's the God that we worship, you know? He'll like never... He'll never stop. He will never stop trying to save us to the last breath. Right? He will try to the last breath to save us. Isn't it possible that they repented later at some point? Yeah, sure, but it's it's possible, but that's not reflected in the scriptures, right? So uh, there's that that's never recorded, and really, there's not much that's recorded about them after the fall. You know, basically, they just have kids, and one kills the other, and then they have another kid. That's basically it, and then they die. You know, that's pretty much it. So, and it's meant intentionally, right? Like it's not meant to be a biography. The stories are told to tell the story of all of humanity. You know, they represent all of us. So it's not meant to be like, oh, if this, you know, then what? It's meant to say like, this happened. This is why we're in this state, right? Because we sinned, you know, humanity sinned and we fell. And now we're in this, we're, we are where we are. I hope that makes sense. Why do people live so long in Genesis? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm going to do a little digging on that. Um, basically, we can say that like mankind was made to live eternally with God. And then the lifespans kind of like shorten as time goes on as the generations get farther and farther from paradise. I don't know. Again, I'd have to look into like what the fathers actually say about that to give it like a more definitive answer on mm -hmm. that topic. But yeah, there's like Methuselah lives. She's like, he's like 900 years old or something like that. He's very old. Um, which we hear or like Abraham even is very old. He, he, and he and his wife have a child of, she's like 95 years old and she has a child. So, um, but I think the idea there, and again, I could be wrong and I'll have to look into it is like, they're close the closer humanity is to paradise, the longer life. And then the farther you get, it trails off, you know? So, yeah, which makes sense. You have a question?
why would the serpent punish the calling of those that are necessary mm -hmm. if it was just being used by Satan? Yeah, remember it's it's a in the story, it's a manifestation. The serpent is a manifestation of evil and the evil one, right? So what really is being set up is is the the warfare between mankind and the evil one and the devil, right? Because God tells the snake that you will you will bite man's heel and he will bruise your head, right? That's what so basically that there will always be now this conflict between mankind and the and the evil one. Because the snake is is not just a snake, he's the devil. It, that's that's what's being represented there in that passage. Um Almost like a human being being yes, upright. He was mm -hmm. upright. And then when that happened, that he banished him to be on his belly because he wasn't originally on his belly. He was upright. And then it was the yeah. back of the But again, like obviously interpretation, I'm almost the father. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to look that yeah, we'll have to look into that and see if there's more explanation there. And too, right? Like think, you know, think of it this way too, right? Like everything was created good. Satan can't just like come and control things, right? It's, it's God's dominion. If things become evil because it chooses that path, right? So whether this the snake wasn't just like possessed by the evil one, again, it, it's it's an embodiment of the evil one. It's almost like, again, choosing evil, you know, and in, 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 it's embodied in the serpent character, right? But again, it's the evil one. It's the, we see when we see the snake, what you're seeing is the devil. But I'll look, in, I'll look into that a little bit more and see if I can get a little more of a precise answer the other thing with genesis and the old stories is like you're not reading like a history book right like moses is not there witnessing the events and writing them and these are revealed to him by god and he's writing them down but the purpose is not to be like oh this happened and then at 705 this happened and That's then at, seven, at 720 this happened and then the snake quote said this right like it's it's meant to tell the story of salvation right and this is the starting point which is the fall right so the purpose is not so much to like make all the different elements, you know, fit into like uh, our modern day sensibilities and histor historicity, right? But to understand what we're talking, what we're to understand God, right? Basically to understand us and to understand God. So the point is that we fell, right? The point is that we sinned, we fell away from God and chose a different path. And this led to all this bad stuff coming into the world, into human reality. And God has acted Right. God now has acted to undo that and to place us back where we belong. So that's more like I don't want to get too stuck on the little minutia. But, yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's information out there. So I'll look into that. Kendra, thank you. Thanks for your question. Any other questions? That was good. Some good questions. Yeah. That's good. All right. I think that's a good place for us to stop. Thank you all. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Well, so next week we're on and two weeks from now, 26th, we will not meet because I probably will have a nice pack on my chin from my oral surgery. So thank you all. God bless. Have a good night.